Hey everybody, welcome to another week of Chasing Frets. Uh, this week, my co-host is Andy Ellis. How are you, man? I am doing well. Given the circumstances, we're all hanging in and we're doing well. That's right. We are uh, alive and, and mostly well, mm-hmm. <laughs> as they uh, uh, allude to our, our alive and well enough, I should say, which kind of uh, ties into our guest this week, which is a bit out of left field for some people might think. And we have uh, Jeff Daniels, the the actor as our guest this week. Actor and very deep guitar player, songwriter. Yes. Yeah, it was, uh, it's definitely not a, a passing hobby with him. His, his guitar roots go really deep mm-hmm. and he is a really fine fingerstyle player. Yeah. Rock solid. And, and this new album is basically a, him setting up in his studio with a handful of nice guitars and playing some songs. Right from the yeah, heart. It's, it's, yep. Yeah. So he's going to be our guest this week. In today's episode, we really dive into his his background as a guitarist, his early years growing up in Michigan, um, and we we dive into some of his early guitar influences, which were really kind of a, uh, in a way, kind of surprising to me. I know the Doc Watson thing kind of came out of left field a bit, yeah. but uh, not surprisingly, most of his influences were just really fine songwriters, yeah. singer songwriters. Right. You can hit us up at chasingfrets at premierguitar dot com. So let's dive right into our first episode here with Jeff Daniels. Today's episode of Chasing Frets is brought to you by the new Taylor GT. The GT is the latest acoustic guitar innovation from Taylor. It features a reduced scale body shape made with all solid tone ones. With its accessible feel and punchy tone, the GT offers an exciting playing experience for any guitarist. For more information, visit taylorguitars.com. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us this week, man. Oh, I'm glad to be here. One of the topics today is I wanted to really kind of dig into your your backstory as a guitarist. And knowing you grew up in Michigan, and we spent, both Andy and I spent some time with your latest record, there's some influences that immediately jump out to me. And a lot of them uh, kind of come from the country and folk side. So when you were, when you were growing up as a kid and starting to discover the guitar, who are some of the players that really grabbed your ear and inspired you to, to pick up the guitar? The first one was Arlo. I saw Arlo mm-hmm. Guthrie at the Masonic Temple in Detroit. I was still in high school. My parents, I had to drive me there. I know because I, I didn't have a driver's license yet. And there he was with an acoustic <laughs> guitar. He had a band, but it was an acoustic guitar. And Allison restaurant, Allison's restaurant was the rage. Oh, that yeah. locked in. Um, Stevie and then I, I, I loved Al, Al, Arlo Guthrie's City in New Orleans. Found mm-hmm. out it was written by mm-hmm. Stevie Goodman. Steve Goodman. Chased that. Mm-hmm. And that led me to Prine. Mm. Um, and, and I had come off Elton John and Bernie Taupin. They were kind of a big deal for me early on. And, and it really was that, that nobody sounded like those guys. And, the you know, like Tumbleweed Connection was an album and the writing of that. The writing on that that just uh, even at a young age i noticed that and and stayed you know stayed in love with it over time so all those guys and then as i got i got to new york and then um uh a friend introduced me to uh um uh, doc watson uh, oh, yeah. and that was oh, like yeah. what is that and then doc watson was at the bottom line in new york city and late seventies with Merle and T Michael Coleman just the trio. And wow. so I went over there to see this guy that I bought some of his albums and my, and he's blind. Are you kidding me? And so and just the three of them were, were, and they didn't need a band and they didn't need amplifiers and they didn't. And then the soon after that Stevie Goodman came through and I saw Stevie at the bottom line, just an acoustic guitar. And the place was packed. It was rocking. He was funny. He could play <laughs> and he could write. And that that led me to everybody after him was was Stevie Goodman. Seeing him at the bottom line, I think that whatever that is, I want to shoot. For that. Did he convert you into being a Cubs fan? No, but but I I, <laughs> I completely stole from him his last dying Cub fans Cub fans request. I believe uh, yeah. I have my own lifelong Tiger fan blues that I have played uh, out, and I have rewritten it fifteen times because we you know keep finding new ways to be horrible. So yeah, 
<laughs> but a straight straight rip off of Stevie. Yeah. There's a Steve Goodman uh, story that uh, that has to do with the city of New Orleans and Arlo Guthrie. And Jeff, you may know this story, but some of our listeners may not. So I'm going to try to tell it really quickly. Um, the one at the bar. Yes, isn't that a good one? Yeah. yeah, it's great. It's it's. I give Arlo credit. He could have blew him off. So so, Arlo just the way I've heard the story is Arlo finished his set, and he and he was you know about to to split, and he was approached by Stevie Goodman, who said. Uh, you know, I'm a songwriter, and I'm sure Arlo rolled his eyes, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. And could, could I play you a song? And he said, I'll tell you what, says Arlo, you buy me a beer, and you have as long as it takes me to drink this beer to play the song. And it was City of New Orleans, and by the time Arlo finished his beer, <laughs> he said, I'm cutting that, you know. That's a great story. That's a pretty cool story. story. And I, you know, I think it's probably true, you know. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. I think Arlo's told it on stage. I mean, that's his version of it, too. I, I, yeah, absolutely. And look what it, 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 if if your way to Stevie Goodman is through that song that Arlo does on the piano, look what you find when you get to Stevie Goodman. That's what, that's what happened to me. A lot of these early influences you named are really known as songwriters first. You know, although they're all fine guitar players. Then we get to Doc Watson, who is a barn burner of a bluegrass flat picker. And was, was kind of and fingerstyle and too. Finger style. So yeah. was there a point when he when he does fingerstyle, he he was slumming. <laughs> yeah, he when, when he was flat when he was flat picking, there was smoke coming off that the that, that So was yeah, there a time yeah. where you kind of aspired to be more of a flat picker than a fingerstyle player? Yeah, I, I, I remember being able to flat pick um, and being able to do some of those G runs, you know. And and on my to-do list, which I still haven't done, is Black Mountain Rag, I think is the name of the song. Just some fancy acoustic guitar. See if I could learn that, but I still haven't done that. But soon after Doc, and I got a tablature book of Doc Watson. That's where I learned how to play Deep River Blues is out of his tab mm-hmm. book. This is like early 80s. And now you're finger picking. And then I found a tablature book. And then then the same friend of mine in my theater company when I was in New York, uh, who had kind of turned me on to Doc Watson, he had a Martin, I had a Guild. He said, uh, have you heard Stefan Grossman and John Renborn? Mm. I said, no. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, showed me the albums or whatever we had cassettes back then. I think it was still albums. And, uh, and I'm going, what's, what's that? And then you go to get tablature books from Stefan Grossman. Now you're into the country blues. Now you're into the one, four, yeah. fives and the, and now the acoustic guitar got fun. Oh, yeah. Now I wasn't trying to be James yeah. Taylor or John Denver or Dan Fogelberg, whatever was back then in the seventies. Now I'm looking at who is Robert Johnson and what's Sun House? What's that? Uh, Charlie mm-hmm. Patton, Lonnie Johnson, guys like mm-hmm. that. Now you're now you're kind of deep diving into that. And so, uh, while at the same time writing, Stevie Goodman influenced John Prine, Lyle Lovett comes along, John Hyatt comes along, um, Christine Lavin. I saw her at the Ark in the late '80s, the Ark in Ann Arbor. And I think Pat Donahue opened for her. Pat was the guy. I, I keep going back to Pat Donahue. I'm still going through some of those DVDs. Yeah. You know, but great mm-hmm. players like that. Kelly Joe Phelps was another oh, yeah. one. And then oh, Keb yeah. Moe. I got yeah. to meet Keb again at the Ark, celebrity my way backstage. And <laughs> we, we, we're, we've been good friends ever since. Yeah, he taught me some stuff. It's just great. Just great. So I've been fortunate. There's a picture. Tell me, there's a picture in the liner notes of your latest album. You're laying on a couch and you're writing something. And and when I'm looking at the picture, I'm looking in the background of like what's going on. Because I could tell it's like a very guitar-centric nook you got there. And if I'm not mistaken, on the wall is a picture of you and Keb. Yeah. Is that true? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he came, he came to Michigan. We shot a video for something he was trying to put together in Nashville where he goes – 
and meets with other artists, songwriters, whatever, and then they you play together with them at the end. So he came up to Michigan, and we came in. I was in our studio, and we we kind of wrote a song together and and did it, and, and that was fun. I enjoyed it. He, you know, he was. I, I got to see him in in California when I was doing uh, Good Night and Good Luck, the Clooney movie, and uh, he had said after I'd met him at the Ark, he goes, "Why don't you just you know come by California? I'll teach you some stuff." Oh, great, would love it. And and you know he was the first guy to you know take me and go, okay, first of all, slow down. Second, mm. uh, be late, mm. barely make it, barely get there. And that's hard. No that's hurry. really hard. Oh, it's really yeah. hard, especially if you go you go into a break and you're just you're just by yourself, acoustic to hang on to that beat, you know, he really emphasized practicing to a metronome because you think your foot isn't speeding up, but it is. Um and that's okay. Everybody does it. You know, bluegrass, they kind of encourage it. You know? They're always on it's in uh, the bluegrass it seems like you you kinda of want to be on that front edge. You're almost like surfing on that front edge but with all these like blues players you talk about it's like 180 degrees you just barely yeah. want to be inside yeah. that beat you know yeah i mean learn how to get behind the beat so uh, but it was, and then the simplicity and the elegance of the way keb plays yeah was uh it and i keep dropping it but these are all guys that that i have played with or been around who would say something and as an acoustic guitar player you just grab it. You know, when you're, I was doing something with a whole bunch of artists one night here in Michigan in front of a packed house and Josh White Jr. was on the bill. And I remember we were doing some version of one more for my baby, one more for the road, that one. He had a great version of that. So I was just kind of playing along and filling behind him. And, uh, and we were, pre and, and we were going and he goes, no, 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 let him hear it. Let him hear it. And it was just like a couple of acoustic notes before you go back into the one. And it was it was like, let him hear it. Let him hear it. Hmm. So great lessons like that from from great players. That's that's funny. One one theme I keep going back to in these conversations Andy and I had have had with a bunch of different guitarists while doing this podcast is, you know, Andy and I are getting the best education that money cannot buy. And it sounds like you're kind of doing the same thing with these brushes. With you know, it could be just a little phrase, like you said, you know. And it's just that there's more to glean from that than every single one of those tab books you bought from Doc Watson, you know, and Steph yeah. and Stefan Renborn and those guys. Or certainly to put on top sure. of them. Yeah, I mean that that's where that's where I kind of when I started playing out, um, like 2001, 2002. Um, I had to get better and uh, um, you got to have the technique and the foundation and the scales and all that stuff. And I dropped out of music theory in college, which is one of my great regrets. Um, it's not essential, but it sure could help. And um, so anything I can pick up along the way and then kind of put it into whatever it is I've turned in however whatever kind of player i've turned into is uh i'm stealing left and right from people yeah they make so, me better was it always the acoustic guitar did you ever uh go through a rocker phase yeah that that's what i uh, yeah i i the, uh, the amplifiers and the electric thing it just was you know it takes two hands to carry that um <laughs> you know and then so i just i just like the acoustic I, and again it was arlo Arlo, I mean, he probably played electric that night, but he was he was basically an acoustic yeah. artist. And I had, you know, Woodstock. There he was with an acoustic guitar going, coming into Los Angeles. I mean, you know, that's that's that was it. That was the, and it was mobile. And I was going to live in New York City by myself at the age of 21 in one room with a hope and a dream, you know. So that I didn't need a lot. I needed one acoustic guitar in the corner, basically to be my best friend. And that's what and that was a guild D40, right? Yeah, I bought it at, yeah, yeah. I've heard David's guitar shop in Ann Arbor, no longer there, but that's, yeah, I went in there and, you know, was looking at a Gibson, which would have been smart because they were made in Kalamazoo, which is, you know, my state, but I bought a guild. I had a D40 from, 
I guess about 1976 is when I bought it. And I wish I still had it. Was the cutaway? No. Was yours the cutaway? No, square, you know, round shoulders, but but yeah, shoulders. Yeah. No. I mean, Richie Havens it, played a Guild D40 at the at Woodstock. I recently yeah. read. So you know, yeah. and, and mine ain't going nowhere. It's it's hanging right there. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> yeah, I guess I've I've seen some videos of you playing, and I believe you use finger picks. Am I? I do. Yeah. Yeah. And so to me, I'm, I'm older than you are, Jeff, so I've observed the different changes of equipment, technique in the acoustic guitar world. And the finger picks, when I came up it, through the folk boom of the, you know, sort of mid-60s onward, a- anyone who played flat top played with thumb and index and middle finger finger picks. I mean, that was the really? in, in the folky thing. Yeah, yeah. So when I see that, and, and that's really not happening today. I mean, it, most of the finger pick, the finger picks that I see on people's right hand have to do with dobro players, you know, because they're, they're playing bluegrass that way. And a lot of the finger style guitarists today are into, you know, body percussion and tapping and different yeah, things like that. Yeah, yeah. When I see the finger picks, it just says to me, um, it's a certain era of of not only the sound, but also who you were listening to. Mississippi John Hurt, Reverend Gary Davis, you yep. know. If if you weren't, I'll bet your first teachers were Stevie Goodman was listening to Reverend Gary Davis yep. and um Bert Janch, you know, from England with Pentangle. You Bert, yeah, Stefan loves Bert. Yeah. Oh. Jeez. Yeah, that. I mean, you go. When I started diving into the Delta, you you find there's Sun House with these big, bright national pick yeah. fingers and a thumb pick, and and that was kind of why I went to them uh, initially. It, well, a couple. Well, that was the main reason because they did, and they they, yeah. they could get a consistency of the sound, especially if you were biting into the blues with the the right hand, and and I um, I liked that. I couldn't get that kind of, I got, I felt like I was playing, uh, when I was using bare fingers, it felt like I was with a, a sock on my hand or something. It was <laughs> but then, you know, Clapton, I mean, you watch him on, I think on the, his live and unplugged, it was, uh, he's bare fingered. Yeah. Stefan, when I took, I got, went to Stefan Grossman's house and had a great lesson with him. And, and he asked me about that because he plays bare fingers and, and I said, well, I, you know, I told them the, you know, and the Delta and all that. But it was also, I liked that consistency of the attack and the sound. And I could, there are variations in there mm-hmm. that I like to be able to, to do now that, you know, you, you com- once you commit to them, then they can be a, a tool, you know. So at what, at what point when you were coming up in New York, did you feel like you had to make a choice between professional musician and professional actor? And when was that? Oh, no, that was never in the cards. I was there to be an actor. Uh, and the guitar was just something I did in the apartment to stay sane, you know, and to creatively still be alive. Because you, you wait for the phone to ring as an actor, and especially starting out, it, you can go months. Well, an interesting um, thing you, you mentioned in, your, in the liner notes on your record is that, you know, acting isn't something you can really practice every day, but guitar is. It is, and it, it, that's that's true. And uh, I was also around um, playwrights off Broadway. Lanford Wilson was one. He ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize for drama, and that was a world that I wasn't. I I, I was learning at the same time, and that kind of the way that the writing, the the imagery, the kind of you know, one of the songs on the album is, is Road Signs, which is a poem that Lanford Wilson handed to me in 1978. Mm. And you learn from that kind of writing. And it was just something I, I, I did for myself um, that I had complete control over. And as an actor, you don't have complete control. Um, you're always giving your performance to someone else. And then a year later, you find out what they did with it. <laughs> And that, that's it. That, 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 that you understand that. But with the music, it was this place I could go creatively um, 
where I, I was the boss, Creative Lab was the boss. And it was never going to be a second career because the acting career kept going well. It was kind of a steady climb for me. I didn't get terms of endearment until I'd been there for, in New York City for seven years. And mm. it, it just climbed. And I even Dumb and Dumber, I'm standing next to Jim. You know, I was never, you know, in that upper echelon of A-listers. And so I, I you know, it, it's, I've been a great career. I've had great roles and all that. But it was always, I always kind of kept waiting for it to fail miserably. And then when it did... I'd be ready with the guitar. So it was always yeah. kind of the, when the acting career ends, this is what I'm going to do because this is what I'm supposed to do kind of thing, whether it's act or write plays or sit in front of 300 people in a club with acoustic guitar. For me, it's all the same thing. So I was going to drop yeah. back to that and be very happy to be honest. And then newsroom yeah. happened. So to wrap up this episode, Jeff, you you've alluded that you're a very serious student, and it seems like you're a lifetime student when it comes to the guitar. You've taken lessons, you've searched out resources, and earlier we were speaking that kind of this this year has been a great time for you to catch up and really focus on guitar. So what is on your guitar to-do list of stuff you want to work on, things you want to get better at on the guitar? Tone. I want to make sure the tone uh, where you play the guitar you don't just, you know, um, it's that it's that constant battle, and you don't always hit it, but it's the same thing as acting on a stage eight times a week, is you want to be able to dance on top of it so that you've done the work on the technique, you've done the work so that the tone is there, the tempo is right, the picking is right, it's complicated. Um, guitar players are going to have to pay attention to it because you've worked on it. And now the, the words you've written, you can not only recite in order, but you can perform. You can make come alive. That is a dance that happens every time, whether I'm doing a live stream or playing a club. It's, uh, it's trying to get on top of it so you can dance on it. And uh, when you do, and everybody who plays out knows that's when it's gold. Same thing with being on Broadway. It's when it's happening tonight and you're on it and then you come off stage and the actors go, boy, you were really on it mm. tonight. It's just yeah. the kind of the, the stars align and, and all of that comes together and you're always shooting for it. But I'll, that's what I'll be working on is continuing to try to find that place where I get to dance on top of it in whatever I do. And Black Mountain Rag. And Black Mountain Rag, yeah. That, that, <laughs> That could take a while. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for hanging with us today. Jeff's going to be our guest all week. So uh, we'll be back later this week with more from Jeff Daniels. Mm -hmm.